Dr. Sarah Smith is a rural family physician and charting coach. She specializes in helping physicians with our charting backlogs so we can get home on time without the looming cloud of unfinished charts and callbacks. We discuss how to add efficiency to your day by making sure you are laser-focused on your patient and you aren't finished until that chart is closed. This frees up mental space for your next patient, making that visit a bit more efficient. By the end of the morning, you're going to need a plan for how you're going to tackle callbacks. We also discuss dictation, scribes, templates, and how this is all easier said than done. Dr. Smith went to medical school at the University of Western Australia and has worked in primarily rural communities as a family physician and is now in Edson, Alberta, Canada. Dr. Smith is a certified life coach and knows firsthand the experience of never being done and having unfinished charts and inboxes begging for your attention. She has hundreds of hours of experience coaching many physicians in the outpatient setting with improving their office and workplace efficiency and finding solutions to getting their work done during their clinical day so they can get home. You can find her at chartingcoach.ca. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee, and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Before we get into the show, let's talk about this week's sponsor, Deputy. At your practice, what happens when the staff call out sick? How much time does it take to find replacements who can fill in? If you need to cancel appointments because you're short-staffed, what does that cost your practice? Deputy is a simple app that's helped more than 250,000 workplaces tackle this problem. Deputy makes it easy to schedule staff in line with patient demand, communicate schedules with your team, and instantly find replacement when someone calls out sick. To learn more and try Deputy for free, go to drpodcastnetwork.com slash deputy. Dr. Sarah Smith, thank you for coming on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. So what is your origin story? How did you become a charting coach that is very specific? Yes. So I'm a family physician and I've mostly worked in rural environments. But after 15 years of doing family medicine, you would have thought I would have some idea how to get home with my charting and paperwork done. Every year it seemed to be getting worse and worse. Why would anyone think that? We all struggle with that. I've been practicing for 10 years and it only seems to be getting worse. So I think that assumption, right? I think so many of us, I would argue most of us are in that boat. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Well, perhaps I'd had enough of that. And I kept wondering what was wrong with me. As a resident, as a junior doctor, as a colleague, I would ask all my mentors, preceptors and older generational consultants, how did they manage the paperwork and charting? How did they do it? And the typical answer was come in Sundays, do it in the evenings. And I'd had enough of that. I didn't want that anymore. That was not the answer I was looking for. And I was looking for answers. So my journey took about 18 months to figure out my charting and paperwork problem and understood finally that it was possible to get home with everything done. So that was the greatest gift I've ever given myself, that investment in time in learning how to do this for myself that I wanted to give back to my colleagues. So I went and certified as a life coach and started helping physicians in the same process that I had followed to get home with everything done. So what's the Cliff's Notes version of the process? Or at least one take home that we can start working on tomorrow. How about we start with that? Perfect. Yeah. So I talk to a lot of physicians about this. And step one is desiring it, like really, truly having had enough of the way it is day in and day out, and truly wanting something better for yourself. And knowing what that better is. So what is the result that you're looking for? Do you truly want to be home with everything done? Is that what you desire? And having a look at what that would mean for you. So we're not talking about getting a new EMR or increased staff or changing how many patients you see a day. We're talking about you in your environment with the staff you work with, the patients that you see, the volume that you're seeing. How can we make it the most simple solutions for you to get home with everything done. So step one is the charting. 
And that is figuring out your most simple solution for getting your charts done as you go. Okay, well, my problem, if I have a, either a particularly complicated assessment and plan, right? So we're writing a bunch of prescriptions, imaging, labs, right? That's going to be time consuming. And I'm looking at three patients in the waiting room. So I've then decided I'm going to save this for later so I can start on the next patient and then I can catch up at lunchtime or I can catch up at the end of the day rather than having those patients wait longer in the waiting room. And actually, I tried this recently and ended up getting chewed out at the end of the day by a patient who had been waiting what they felt was an unreasonable period of time. You know, it's always in the eye of the beholder. So how do I finish that patient's chart without sweating those patients in the waiting room? Yeah. So it's not going to be an overnight process to be able to see patients in closed notes. Part of the other thing that we do with physicians is start looking at the minutes and seconds in the room with the patient. So the amount of time you spend in the room with the patient is a significant portion of your day. And then we need to look at where do those minutes and seconds go? What are we doing in the room that could be better or more efficient, more productive to help us to gain back some minutes and seconds there? So it won't be just simply tomorrow going in and seeing a patient and closing a note and not expecting some amount of unfamiliar discomfort, running behind, the whole process is messy and uncomfortable. But when you are thinking about I will do that later. That thought you had of this was complicated. I will do it later. That decision there meant that you got homework. Okay. So if you have that commitment of, I do not want to do this later anymore. I'm done with later. So now what? How would we get that note done? Where would we get it done in a more effective way? And so we're not saying that you need to change how you practice. We're going to take what you do right now and make it the most efficient and simple solution for you. So what you do is you watch doctors with their patients. Is that what you do? You observe them to see? I just ask you, how do you do it right now? Okay. So then where do you find those minutes and seconds? There are lots of minutes and seconds. For instance, every time you leave the room to get something, Ask yourself why. Start being observant. Start being aware of what do I leave the room for and why? Because no doubt, as you leave the room, there's somebody outside there to ask you a question. As you get interrupted, you're then having to think about their question plus keeping in mind what's happening in the room. That whole process is slowing you down. Some physicians are getting multiple knocks on the doors during consultations. Some are getting pop-up messages. Some leave the room to go grab forms or stamps or stethoscopes or lidocaine or syringes or band-aids. All of those minutes and seconds are compounding. When you start your day, did you start right on time? Or was it nine minutes past the hour when you first get into that first room? So when physicians say, I hate running behind, but you started nine minutes late. Now we have minutes and seconds that we can start to find. So that will be somewhat of a systems and processes, but we start with you. We start looking at what are you doing and how can you start to be curious with where are my minutes and seconds going? So that reminds me of a podcast I did with Sanj Kachel, who is a radiologist with a master's in positive psychology. And he was talking about focus and we likened it to our smartphones, where if you have all these different apps open, it draws some of the RAM memory. And so your phone doesn't work as efficiently. So you've got to close all of those apps and just focus on the one that you're doing. So what you're saying is, whatever you're doing, stay in the room, 100% focused on the patients, no distractions, which the patients are going to appreciate, which also translates into a more efficient visit, because then they have your undivided attention, which makes the visit go faster. So you don't need to make it seem like you have their attention. You actually are giving them your undivided attention. So that makes it go efficiently in and of itself. Yes. Okay, great. So also think about this. So if you're seeing the seventh patient of the day and all your charts were closed, think about your brain with that patient at its highest level of clinical decision-making because you can truly listen to the story and bring together all of the physical exam findings plug in your illness script, getting those medical decision-making skills at their highest level, because you're not thinking about, oh, I still have to do that. Oh, I forgot to do that for the last six patients of the day. Okay. I'm going to challenge that for a second. And I think your answer is going to be, it's a messy process and you have to keep working on it. 
Yes. But another thing that happens to me is when I'm done with my patients for the morning, the next thing I have to do is my callbacks, any callbacks that happened, any labs or studies that came in. But I've earned myself a break because I've been working very hard seeing patients. So what do I do? I eat my lunch and I scroll the internet, right? Instagram, Twitter, whatever. I'm scrolling mindlessly because I've earned it. Lo and behold, my lunch is up and it's time to start seeing patients again. And I haven't done any of the labs or any of the callbacks from the morning. So now that's been set for the end of the day. But haven't I earned it? So I'm going to suggest that you are a human and you have a human brain. So that thought right there, I deserve this. That there is an expensive thought. That thought right there is costing you going home on time right there. But our brain, our brain loves pleasure. It hates pain and it likes to do things efficiently. So what you just showed me was I like pleasure. Facebook is pleasurable. I hate pain. Doing the inbox right now is the least likely of things I would love to do right now. And if I'm uncomfortable about that inbox because there's so many decisions to make in there and my brain's tired right now, then I'm going to escape into Netflix or into Facebook. And that escape or avoidance is actually false pleasure. It's not pleasure that you've earned and it's guilt-free. This is guilty pleasure because you're like, I really should be doing the inbox, but I really don't want to when I'm avoiding that inbox. And then we do things efficiently. So every lunchtime, your brain is linking, oh, it's time to check my Netflix. It's time to check my Facebook. It's time to check my Instagram. Whatever it is that you go to, you will always be pulled towards that every lunchtime. So you've linked lunchtime, eating, and Instagram. That's just how your brain goes. So you're doing it very efficiently. So you're right. In that lunch break, and I like to call it lunch break, but it's not really. Like you actually have work of today to do. There are messages, there are scripts to fill. At some point, you have to get them done. That is the work of today. If we want to get home with today's work done, that protected time is going to be super useful to you, but your brain isn't wanting to show up and do it. Of course it wants anything else, cookies, a chat with the staff, another cup of coffee. Like it will literally ask you to do anything but the inbox at that moment. That sounds like weight loss to me. That sounds like someone who's trying to lose weight, right? So they're avoiding these things that they know they're not supposed to eat. But I see it being a kind of a slippery slope like that. Like, I'm on Weight Watchers. I'm watching my points. Oh, but I ate something and now I've got too many points. You know what? Today's a wash. Today's a wash. So you know what I'm going to do for the rest of the day because it's a wash. I'm going to eat whatever I want. And then suddenly I haven't written any of my notes for the day. I haven't done any of my, and now it's the end of the day and I've got all of those and I'm back to where I started and I'm back to my old habits, Mm -hmm. right? And yet when our patients come in and they are having trouble, I mean, I don't know, you might have a different answer for your patients. I don't have a good answer for them for how to tell them to effectively start and stick to new habits without ultimately ending up back to their old habits. I mean, we do have an episode a long time ago with BJ Fogg, who's a PhD who studied habits, right? Tiny habits. I've tried that. So if I don't have a good answer for them to stick with their habits, how could I have a good answer for myself? Mm -hmm. How do I make sure I don't end up just back in my old habits again? So that's a great question. And so a lot of what we do together is CBT training. So it's CBT for you and it's CBT for your patients. So that motivational interview, some of those persuasion techniques that you were talking about on a recent podcast as well. So think of your brain like a six-year-old. If you ask your six-year-old to do homework and you don't supervise it and you give them a big stack of paper, where will you find them in 10 minutes? You'll find them under the table playing Lego or upside down on the couch right? Anywhere else, like literally anywhere else. When our patients want to smoke and we've taken them outside every morning to smoke, when you tell that brain, you can't have a smoke today, it's going to have a tantrum. When we tell you it's time to do your charts or it's time to do your inbox, your brain wants to have a tantrum. So we treat it like a six-year-old. So our brain does not like to make a plan and carry it out in one step. So we plan ahead for that inbox. We start to prioritize what should I be doing in my, you know, before I start for the day, if I had some protected inbox time, then what would make sense for me to do 
in my middle of the day break and what would make sense for me to do before I go home in the afternoon. So we start planning for ourselves that future self. So you're going to say tomorrow in my middle break when I'm doing inbox, it would make sense to do this, this, and this. Okay. So we've made a plan. Right. Then Brad at lunchtime tomorrow is going to show up and want to do anything else. Just so now we treat you nicely. We say, listen, I've planned it out for you. All you have to do is this half an hour of work, starting with the labs and then the phone messages. That's it. At 1.30, you're going to go see patients. So that you're making that relationship with yourself where we're not being mean and nasty anymore. We're not going to give you 600 results to do in 30 minutes. That's just being, that's just being mean, right? Then we're mad at ourselves from yesterday and we don't want to do it today. Then as you finish the work that you've set for yourself, we start to be proud of you. You start to say, that was awesome. Look at me. I'm going home earlier than ever. That's fantastic. I love this. Thanks for making that happen today. So this is how we start to create new relationships with ourselves and how to help our patients with that persuasion, the planning, the treating your brain, just like a six-year-old. It's going to have a tantrum when you tell it it's time to do homework. We expect that. We know it's going to show up and we say, it's okay. I know you want cookies, but we're getting this work done because we planned it out so we can go home earlier. And then we just keep in mind that most important why. Why did we want this in the first place? Remember, I said at the beginning, we want to know where you're going. What is the result you want to create for yourself? What if anything was possible to see patients and go home after the last patient with everything done? Because it is if you want it bad enough and if you're ready to do the work to get there. Okay. I'm mentally getting there. Were there any other things that you would find when you're coaching people to squeeze these few seconds or few minutes out of the patient's visits? Like I get, okay, I've got to stop screwing around, right? Mm -hmm. Although part of that, I would blame my partners because we don't have an office. We have, it's called a pit where it's just a U-shaped room where everybody has their computers. So there's a lot of chatting going on. So I would actually, it would probably make sense for me to do my callbacks in one of my exam rooms further away from the temptation of chatting with my partners. So I guess engineering your day. That's right. It's really hard to change other people. You can desire it as much as you want. It's like, they should stop talking. They should respect my time. They should, they should, they should. The problem is you can't control other people. You can only control the person in front of you. And so when you have that commitment of, I would really love to just smash through these phone calls and get home. And you're like, the U pit is not helping me. So I'm going to go choose a consult room that is perfect. And then you try it out and you're like, the consult room was a terrible idea. The internet was wrong and the connection was bad. That didn't work. Now what? So not quitting and saying that was a terrible idea back to the U pit and you end up exactly where you were before. You're simply saying, I'm going to get this result for myself. I'm going to have a pile of success or fails. That's fine. So long as I don't quit. So long as I don't quit and I'm still walking in the direction of I'm creating the best clinical day for myself, that's when we get the result you want. So during the visits themselves, we want to minimize distractions from the patient interaction. So we bring it from A to Z, straight line from the beginning to the end of the visit with no leaving the room, no mental distractions, no physical distractions. Is there anything else that you've seen where we can shave a couple seconds or a couple minutes off? our visits? You know the the way you work in your day. And so every physician is going to be slightly different. You might find templates helpful to you. There's something you're doing a thousand times a day, like bringing up a blank form and ticking boxes. Start being curious about what do I put in those boxes and start to help yourself make this simpler or faster. Being curious with how long do I chit chat for and why? So you know that rapport building at the beginning, your patients typically know you very well. And our time is very precious in that room. So if we're doing a lot of chit chat, we're going to start to compound those minutes in the day. Just be curious with yourself about why you've decided to spend that time and is it of true value to the patient? And then we're really learning to lead the consultation. So if you say yes to five things in the room, What else are you saying yes to? You're probably saying yes to doing that referral letter later and writing the note later because you've decided to do too many things in the room. And I say it, you've decided to. It's 100% your responsibility how long that consultation goes for. When we understand that it is with 
in our ability to craft that consultation so that it runs to time with enough time for charting, then we're curious with ourselves. What am I saying yes to in the room and why? And thinking about decisions for now and later. So if I say yes to that chest pain because I've triaged it as important, I'm also saying yes to making my patients wait 20 more minutes while I do this. That reminds me of an interview I did with Jonathan Winkle, who's MedPeds in Federally Qualified Health Center, where one of his recommendations was you set an agenda with the patient at the beginning where you get to choose two things and they get to choose one thing or vice versa. So you're setting limits at the beginning of the visit where they get to set their priorities, but you also get to set your priorities and then that sets. So you're not doing five things, you're limiting it to three. So I think that works really well. Even that as a rule though, three things can still be too many. If you've got one big thing we have to discuss today, but agenda setting, a lot of physicians trip over this agenda setting piece because then they get the list and then they don't know what to do with it and how to make it one or two things off the list. They get really stumbling over this. We do a lot of coaching around this. Agenda setting is shown to help craft those consultations into a shorter time period if you know how to lead the consultation. That means I'm going to do this and this today because they look really important. And is that okay with checking with patient or if I miss something that they're not remembering? And then we have that bit of negotiation. It's still going to be a tripping point. It's going to be unfamiliar if you first start doing it and you'll hate it. You'll be like, why do I have these 10 things? What do I do with them now? So understanding that while agenda settings in the literature shows reduced time in the room, not necessarily. Some physicians really don't like it. Before our conversation, I was, and still am, considering getting a scribe. Because if I got a scribe, then they would be closing my chart notes. They would be finishing my chart notes. I wouldn't need to be doing it. I'd be in the next room with the next patient while they're finishing up the chart note. So then I wouldn't have to be as strict with myself about making sure that it's done because I've basically outsourced it. How do you feel about scribes? You would think that a scribe would be helpful. But here's the issue with scribes. So our staff in our offices are either strategists or tacticians. Tacticians do very well off a flowchart. They can tick boxes all day long, but no think. Strategists are thinkers. You are a strategist. So all physicians are strategists. We have to think through problems and come up with solutions. So many of the staff in our offices are just tacticians. They're just going to do as they're told. So a scribe is going to be a significant onboarding process. You have to be committed to slowing right down if you want to get this result for yourself because they don't know how you like it recorded, where you put it in the chart. Most physicians are still doing their assessment plan, prescriptions, MRIs, referral letters, all the other pieces. The only bit that's written down is a history of presenting complaint, possibly the physical exam if you've spoken it out loud to them and helped them understand what you mean when you say those things. And then the assessment and plan, if you've got a great strategist, some people do, as you're chatting to the patient to explain what's happening and what you're planning to do, they can put that into medical speak and put it into the chart note. But most physicians are then doing their assessment plan, scripts, all the things after the encounter. So it isn't see the patient and everything is done as you would expect. So it does understand if you get a scribe, it's a significant onboarding process. I would recommend that you do that via video if possible, because when they leave after a month, which they can do, the next time you do it, there's less onboarding because they can watch a few of the training videos, for instance. So you're building an asset for your business. Same with as you're onboarding new medical staff. It's just a way of building an asset for your business is to conduct those trainings in a way that you can record them and understand them for future staff, holiday staff, leaving staff, coming staff. Fantastic idea. What about carry forward comments, templates? Do you have any other recommendations, dictation, dragon? What do you recommend that your clients do to make themselves more efficient? Yeah. So if you know that you always do certain things in a certain way, especially if, like if you're a specialty and you always have the certain diagnoses that you're always using, then obviously templates are going to be helpful if they're yours and you've created them and you're not constantly editing them. So you want to use shortcuts and templates that you've crafted for your use. So it is actually making it faster in the room. So anything that saves you minutes and seconds, I'm all for it. 
dictation. So if you are typing in the room and you want to change to dictation, that's a whole new process to learn. It might be faster, but it's going to be a learning process. So that's just another obstacle to getting what you want. So if you're already used to charting by typing, you're probably going to optimize that first. A lot of physicians do like to dictate. So now we need to make sure we build in time for dictation within that consultation appointment time. So if the appointment time is 20 minutes and you need six minutes for dictation, now you've got 14 minutes in the room with the patient. And if we understand that, then we can be very clever with our time so you can leave the room and go and dictate and get it done. So that would be how you see patients in closed notes all day long. Yeah. For me, I dictate in front of the patient so that they hear a summary of the visit. At the end of the visit, this is what we talked about. This is what we're going to do. This is exactly what's going into your chart. And then at least in our office, it prints out if I get my notes done on time. That's making a big assumption there. So it works really well in theory, but I've got to actually practice what we're preaching right now in order to make sure that they actually get that. So that's always really helpful. What about reviewing results? One of my partners, if it's a simple result, like strep test is negative, right? He'll have his medical assistant call. And if it's a complicated result, they need to come in. So he's not going to review anything like, oh, your CAT scan. So something that I do, they're coming in for a sinus problem, get a CAT scan to the sinuses. Turns out it's normal. It's probably not sinus problem. It's probably migraines. So I will call them with the CAT scan result, whereas he brings them in. So that's his style. At least when I was starting out and trying to build a practice, I called everybody to just build rapport, build a brand give everyone the top shelf experience. I just don't have time for that now. So what is it that you recommend that your clients do? So that is going to be super dependent on the pay structure for the physician. So if you're not getting paid for phone calls, that patient that you mentioned that you thought was sinus headaches and then the CT is normal, well, we still have a patient with headaches. So it's of good value to bring that patient in a personal encounter if you're only getting paid for in-person visits. So that you, when you see that CT, that patient for your particular physician will be an in-person visit because then the physician's getting paid to do the work and the patient is getting reviewed with regard to their headaches. So we didn't find the answer. Now what? It could be migraine. Do we need to listen to the story again and do another exam? Is there any other things that we've missed about this now that we know? Oh, right. That- I'm an ENT, so I don't see <laughs> migraines. I would be sending that to someone else. You're a family physician, so you're carrying it through. Yeah. So it's a different dynamic because you're going to continue treating that patient. Yes. Whereas I will not. Exactly. So that's where we start to build rules within your inbox. So what pauses you? What slows you down? So you see the CT result. It's a normal sinus. And that question that comes back and forward in your brain, should I call them? Shouldn't I? Should I? Shouldn't I? I don't know. What should I do? Once you decide what you do, you decide your MA calls them and says, your sinuses are normal, back to your doctor to investigate your headaches. There's your rule. And now those CT scans are super fast because you know exactly what you do with them rather than kicking them around in that inbox for weeks and weeks, deciding what should I do with that? That's just annoying me now. Should I call the patient? Should I get them in? Should I just, I don't know. As you keep closing it, you're seeing it like five, six, seven times. That is wasting our time and making that inbox take way longer than it should. So as you come across stumbling blocks in the inbox, start to be curious, how do I solve this? What do I end up deciding to do? Because everything eventually leaves the inbox. How did you solve it? And then you know for next time how to make it even faster. One of my other hangups is my inbox with regards to calling people back where they didn't pick up the phone. Yes. They didn't pick up the phone. It's still in my inbox. I called. (laughs) Maybe I left the voicemail. I waited for a long time for that stinking voicemail message to finish. I left my message and now can't leave the inbox because there's an important result in there. So how do I prevent that from accumulating? Because that's another thing that like just slowly accumulates. When am I going to call this patient back? Maybe it's later in the week. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's right. Because it seems like what you're saying is have systems so that you know that's when you're going to address this. So. What's my system? Okay, so how did you solve it? Do you end up leaving it there and trying the patient multiple times? Because that's not physician work. Yes. That's somebody else's job to call them, find out when they're going to be available and schedule it for you to be available if it is truly that you want to get them on the phone. 
or you have somebody on the phone who gets them on the phone and then patches it through to you. So you're doing inbox until that call comes through. So you get to decide this is the thing. You're the boss. Yeah. And we forget to empower physicians to say, hey, that's not physician work. That's a very expensive receptionist at that point, seeing if a patient's available on the phone for those cold calling. You might decide, I love to call patients with their results. I do that between one and two on Fridays. They're very fast appointments. Be available between one and two on Friday and the MA sets them all up for you. But you get to decide how you want to do this. There's a thousand different ways to figure it out. You just have to make the decision. How do I want to do it? How do I get paid to do it? What do I like to do? What closes the loop for me in the best way? You might just start sending letters out. But again, if you're not sure the patient's going to receive it, for you, it's not a safety net. You can't close the loop. That's not the one you're going to choose. That's not the one for you. So it's very physician dependent on how they're getting paid, what they decide to do, what's the flexibility within their schedule. Many physicians have no flexibility in here about when patients can be booked in, how long for that type of thing. So we've really got to work within the systems that you have available to you. Come up with a system, stick with it so that it's not on your mind, nagging you and sitting in your inbox indefinitely. Yes, correct. Got it. Well, this has been fantastic. I'm going to start applying it tomorrow. Perfect. I'm going to start coming up with systems, sticking with them, and I'm going to be closing out my notes after each visit, or at least I'm going to start trying and recognize that just like eating better and exercising more, it's going to be a messy process and I'm going to fall off the wagon as long as I'm willing to get right back on. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know exactly how you're going to get there, but so long as you don't quit, you can fail and succeed as many times as you like until you get there. Okay, so what services are you offering? The Charting Champions Program for Physicians, and that is a lifetime access program for physicians. We have the core modules, which are the charting after every patient, the inboxes, the consultation, the interruptions and distractions and the backlog because every physician who comes to me has a backlog of some description whether it be a few days old or whether it be months and months or years and years of uncomplete charts so we do all of that inside the program we have a supportive community of your peers so that you have physicians to talk to and ask them all about templates and carry forward comments and all the things that you love to get in the weeds about we have the coaching calls weekly we get to come online and pick my brain and think out loud about your problem. So we really, coaching is simply what we did today. We're just examining what's happening for you and why. Where are your obstacles? What do you love about Instagram at lunchtime? And what would you be willing to do instead in order to be able to get home with everything done? Um, So that's coaching. Very simply, just looking at what's going on and finding your simple solutions. And then I have a guest speaker each month. So you can learn other things like burnout or overeating or money coaches or stress coaches or sex coaches. We have lots of different resources for physicians inside. Wow. Yeah. It's super fun. So where can people find you? What's the website? Chartingcoach.ca. Canada. I wouldn't have thought the accent was Canadian. It isn't. It's Australian, but I've been here for eight years. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I also have a second program called Smarter Charting, which is for your nurse practitioners and physician assistants if they're struggling to keep up with you in your clinical day. I separated the two groups because physicians just love to talk to each other. I understand. It's not that it's different content because we're all charting the same stuff. It's just that we're tribal, I like to say. We're tribal. So we like to communicate with our own. Okay. Wonderful. I love it. Well, I think it's fantastic. I think this is a huge point of burnout for people. It really plagues us. And a lot of this just comes from habits and systems that we need to sit down and work on. And it helps to have someone coach you through it and some peers to work through it with you. So wonderful. You're doing great things for physicians. So I applaud you for it and thank you for it. Oh, my pleasure. I love everybody to get home with everything done. That is my mission and vision statement for everybody. Fantastic. Well, thanks again and have a good night. What a great show with charting coach Sarah Smith. But before we end, here's a quick reminder. If you want to boost efficiency across your practice and make staff scheduling easier, try the Deputy app. You can try this award-winning technology for free by going to drpodcastnetwork.com slash deputy. That's drpodcastnetwork.com slash deputy. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. 
If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.